Because we are just getting started, and this is a class, we should probably take attendance. So just off the bat, we're very curious to know, how many times have you been to Dino 101? Are you a newborn squidlet, a child squidlet, an adult squidlet? I spelled that one wrong. Or have you died of old age, gotten battered, fried, and consumed, and am now experiencing reality via the consciousness of a human? Please vote accordingly in our attendance poll. Is squidlet the real word? I, is That's Sarah, what we use. I mean, have I ever published it in a peer-reviewed journal article? No, uh, but we all use it, so. Okay, that counts. That's the cutest that word I've ever heard. Yeah. Well, there's no other name for a squidlet, a paralarva, a uh, juvenile, a hatch. Richard suggested a uh, cephalopup. Oh, that's very cute. Thank you. Um, Thank it you. looks like almost half of you guys have been here forever. We have about a quarter of you first-time newborn squidlets. Again, thank you guys for being here. Let's let's get weird with it. Tonight, like every night, we have a dino of the day. I'm going to get rid of your guys' screens for just a hot second. I'm sorry. We got to highlight our dino of the day. Now, should you... Oh, that's Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Should you choose to render this? You can choose ink and paper, digitally, watercolor, whatever you want to do. Um, at the end of our time together, we are going to go around the whole Zoom room. You guys are going to hold up your what is surely to be incredible pieces of art. That's I'm going to drink. I'm sorry. That was awful. Tonight's dino of the day is actually our guest spurt's absolute favorite dinosaur. It is the one, the only, the Ankylosaurus, not the Inkylosaurus, but the Ankylosaurus, one of the most heavily armored dinosaurs of all time, basically a walking tank. Ladies and gentlemen, your job is to render Ankylosaurus, should you choose to, utilizing some new form of protection. We know many species of squid ink for protection. Maybe your Ankylosaur is uh, inking, maybe your Ankylosaur is covered in barbed wire. However you want to one up level up your ankylosaurus level protection that's what we want to see rendered uh i'm excited to see these but not nearly as excited to bring on our very special guest ladies and gentlemen the founder of skype of scientists and a woman who has probably about 20 cats in her home right now sarah mcanulty why do you have so many cats in your home if you are a squid scientist your whole Great social question I probably actually have 20 animals in my house right now, but not all cats. Uh, so I foster cats in Philadelphia through ACPT. It's like the pound basically. So I have three little kittens and then mama cat and then my two cats who always live here and then another cat, seven cats. So you're just living your best life is what it sounds like. Yeah, I just, you know, really wanted to lean in to me uh, during the pandemic. <laughs> okay. Okay, Philly's the place to do that, or so I've heard. All right, enough chit chat, Sarah. You've played Dino or Dino twice, so I know it is just like everyone else. It's your favorite game. Here is how everyone's favorite game, Dino or Not a Dino, is going to work. I'm going to read you a list of 10 different animals, some of which are real, actual dinosaurs, some of which I have totally made up. Your job is to simply discern the real dinosaurs from the fake. I'm sure people in the chat will be helpful we'll see uh, if you need a spelling at any point i'm happy to spell any of these also remember for the not dinosaurs there's a theme there's a theme for the night dinosaurs you can figure that out as we go you're a queen among peasants 10 animals are you ready to dig in yes okay here we go animal number one diablo ceratops diablo ceratops oh Ooh, we have some dissent Thanks. in the chat. I, I need a relatively quick answer. What do you think? Not a dino. What? Not a dino. That is incorrect. Diablo Ceratops is a dinosaur. It's okay. It's it okay. Next, Denisuchus. Denisuchus. <laughs> Lots of no's in the chat. Lots of no's. Lots of no's in the chat for Denisuchus. Okay, let's say no, because everybody seems to be saying no. Okay, well, okay, okay, that is correct. You are now one for one. Next, right. Saltosaurus. Yes. Saltosaurus. Yes. That is correct. Saltosaurus is a dinosaur. You're now two and one. Question number four Paranthodon. Paranthodon. What do you think, folks? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Wow. Yeah, I see some non committal yeses in the chat. Yeah, good. All right. You yep. tested them. They didn't test themselves. You're getting a lot of help. I am, but well, why not? Like, no, you should. It's amazing. Three and one. Yeah. You're halfway yeah. there, almost halfway there. Next, 
Delotopus. 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 Yes. Dino. That was the most tentative. Yeah, are you going yes? I'm going yes, a dino. That is incorrect. That is not a dinosaur. Ooh, three and two, keeping it spicy. Here we go. Next, Talarurus. Talarurus. All right. So, so far, our not a dinos are. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Dennis something. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to repeat back? So yeah. far, uh, your not a dinos were Denisuchus and uh, Dilotopus. I so like far, this story. makes no sense to me. So uh, that that's part of the game, Sarah. I need an answer for Talarurus. Enough stalling. Uh, Talarurus. No. That is incorrect. Talarurus is a dinosaur. This is getting dramatic. You're three and three. Three and three. You only have to get six out of ten. If you don't get six, no, but that's, that's a lot. Okay, keep going. We're gonna. Here we go. Next, Macornithorops. 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 <laughs> Sarah, listen, Sarah, we, this is not an a dino. No, we need it. Not a dino. That is not a dino. So that's correct. You're now four and three. Next. Oh. Next, Euplocephalus. That's Euplos a dino. It has Ceph in it. Yeah, but. Like Ceph. Okay. Yeah, but it doesn't start with um, Char Charl. That is correct. You are now five and three. Wait, did we skip one? What happened? I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, I skipped one. Next, Archaeo, Archaeo McPoyle. Archaeo McPoyle. That's not a dino. That is not a dino. Uh, you are now six and three. There. Were, okay, now the last one, uh, <laughs> the waitress. <laughs> That's not a dino. That's not a dino. Have you figured out the theme? It's always <laughs> sunny. These are all, it's always sunny. The waitress, uh, Archaeo McPoyle. We had Mac Ornithorops, D. Lodopus, Dennis Soukis. Uh, It's always sunny in Philadelphia. You did great. Congratulations. You're now a three time winner. You've got a three peat. I think that's called like getting a turkey in bowling or something. Hat trick of. Yeah, it's three goals. Yeah, that's three. All right. Now we're about to talk about squid. Before we do that, um, I just want to mention that like, I actually had calamari earlier today and I was thinking about all the great squid dishes there are like squid sashimi, calamari, uh, squidding pasta, lots of great dishes made out of squid. But we are curious to know which is your least favorite squid dish? Which is the worst squid dish? Is it squid tiramisu, squid covered strawberries, broccoli chicken squidderoll, lucky charms and squid, or a foot long squid dog? <laughs> long squid dog <laughs> i can imagine <laughs> dude no a foot long squid dog would be the best of all of these i would imagine like scooping out the organs of the squid and then stuffing it with delicious stuff maybe some citrus okay okay christina that's, what, that's what i would predict if if you were to ask me like what is a foot long squid dog chat i see you Morningstar has made a tofu squid and you have to choose. Oh. Our veggies in the chat. Oh, I'm not, you need to commit to one of these. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It feels like choosing the least bad of great options. Wow, that's, that was yeah, not That's a bold thing. statement. Okay. okay. Well, we've got 86% yeah. of the vote in. Um, broccoli chicken squid roll lost, came in last place, but hey, guess what? Lucky squids and, or lucky charms and squid. I did not see that coming. Did not see that coming. Lucky Charms and Squid. Uh, oh, I, I thought the marshmallows were kind of squid-like as it was. It didn't seem like so much of a leap to me. Squid and strawberries is gross. Yeah. Squid tiramisu is ultra gross. Yeah, that's the one for me, the squid tiramisu. The, I picture it like the tentacles are the lady fingers. Mm, yuck. Hey, Sarah, you want to yeah. talk about squid? You're welcome. Yeah, I'd love, that's all I want to do. Cool, we should do that, but first we're going to talk about dinosaurs. Oh, fine. <laughs> Yo, these were our not, these are our dinosaurs and dino, not a dino. They were all different type of armored protected dinos. It's not just the ankylosaurs. We have a lot of different ones like Diabloceratops, which is a ceratopsian. We have the Osteoderm saltosaurus, a type of sauropod. We got 
Paranthodon. Look at this spiky Stegosaurus relative. And then we also have a fair amount of other types of Ankylosaurus, like Talarurus, as well as Euplocephalus. This dude's not so dissimilar from the dino of the day today, Ankylosaurus. But all of these lived during the Mesozoic, and cephalopods predate that. Cephalopods go way, way back. So Sarah, can you, we thought we would kind of order tonight in relative uh, temporal order, starting with some of the oldest cephalopods to ever exist. So Sarah, I want you to tell us what, what's the deal with Camarocerus and why did you decide that we should start with it? I wanted to start with it because it's one of the most like stunning, amazing, uh, old, old, old cephalopods because look at that thing. It is huge. It had a lot of range. The, back in the Ordovician, when these uh, cephalopods lived, there were a lot of cone-shaped cephalopods. You, When you uh, see fossils from the Ordovician, you'll often, in that area, see a lot of cone-shaped things. Um, I probably have one of those fossils around here somewhere. They're amazing. Uh, they, so they lived from 485 to uh, 443 million years ago. Um, and scientists suspect that as adults they wouldn't really be able to swim that much because that amount of shell like three meters to the the biggest that they ever found it's not a confirmed fossil um because it got broken or something is nine meters long that's too long but this, so they think that it probably did a lot of like um sit and wait and ambush but we used to think that about the giant squid um as you know as recently as the early 2000s and 90s they were like that's probably just a one of those squid that just dangles and waits um so how do we know you know we shouldn't make judgments based on the incredibly heavy large body of Camarocerus. another name for Camarocerus, some call it uh endoceris um so you can put that uh, in your back pocket for whenever you need that information um but other than that that's really all we know about them they're massive and awesome uh and really really old really really really, really old. old they're older yeah. than ammonites which is my segue to a woman who i knew was incredibly excited to talk about ammonites before i even asked her if she wanted to talk about ammonites tonight christina how far back are we going uh when we talk about ammonites uh ammonites cover a pretty big period of time so coming out of ceratoceras times yeah end of the 400 ish million years ago range all the way through dino times, the end Cretaceous, so 65, 66 million years ago. Uh, when you see cephalopods, in general, they went from coney boys to swirly boys to shellless boys. Uh, so ammonites are these classic, iconic, swirly shells, and that's what we find of them in the fossil record. Uh, yeah, everything from a tiny guy like this big, what I have on, to these absolute <laughs> chonkerinos. Yeah, here's one. Uh, this is from the American Museum of Natural History, where I spent a summer uh, measuring these guys. So they could have been hand size, or they could have been whole swimmer person long swirly shells. Yeah. Um, yeah, what I think is so cool about these, these massive shells, the animal only lived in the first chamber of the, of the shell. You wouldn't have had a swirl shaped uh, cephalopod. The soft parts just lived in the front and they used the other chambers of the shell to regulate where they were in the water column. So they could send gas through and uh, move up and down to catch their snacks. When I learned that, I immediately thought of Titanic and how they could only get so much water into certain chambers which would before it would go up or down. The same, oh, oh, oh. She, of course she has one. Let me oh, highlight that. Hold on. I love him. Isn't that opalized, Sarah? I love, I love the iridescence, Sarah. Sarah, I think you might be muted. I think I might have done that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it is opalized. So a lot of, of ammonites are opalized. And you can get them super cheap online, like four bucks, because they're a super, super abundant fossil. Um, yeah, here's another one. Little, little tiny, little squidlet. Nice. I've seen a lot of uh, ammonite jewelry. So... I wanted to mention one last type of ammonite because I think it's a good transition into talking about, well, A, dinosaurs, because anything I can do to transition to dinosaurs, I'm going to do, but also into extant living squid today. This is one that I didn't know about until Sarah taught me about it literally this week. I feel like maybe I saw an article about it a while ago. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you what Sarah introduced to me as the paperclip squid. 
Diplomoceris. Yeah, yeah, Diplomoceris, uh, not, not Clippy, age 25, but Diplomoceris, age 68 million. This is a real animal. It wasn't tiny either. Like this is a pretty large animal. Uh, Sarah, before we transition out of this, what, how and why was it shaped like a paperclip? Like I can understand the, the spiral nature of most like Nautilus and Ammonites, but what, like, I'm trying to think evolutionarily speaking, what is the, does this make it like faster maybe? There's less drag because there's enough, I, I don't, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the beauty of ancient squid is that they had a lot of time to experiment with a lot of goofy stuff. You find ammonite shells that have little like spiky protrusions off of them. They have all different really beautiful and incredibly intricate weird ways to connect their shells like together. Um, not from one one to another, but like the, the chambers connecting. Um, and why? I don't know. I mean, the the big sort like frisbees are less hydrodynamic than squishing it down. Maybe that's what they were going for, hearkening back to the more coney days. I I don't know, but um, I'm so glad that they went there. Uh, uh, proud of them for trying. I so what I want to direct your attention to, other than the fact that it looks like Clippy, is that these guys were around about 68 million years ago. Years ago, so they are contemporaries of, for instance, Tyrannosaurus Rex. So they were around at the same time that the mass extinction that killed 75% of all living things, including all non-avian dinosaurs, they were there too, and they befell the same fate. So like that is a point of, of connection, I think, between dinosaurs and between and uh, cephalopods, you know, going back to a place millions of years ago in a place far, far away. And I know we've all been stuck in our homes for a while and it's cold outside. So we're thinking a lot about vacations. So... Christine and I were just curious as we chatted this week planning, you know, we want to know where your vacation is. Are you going to go vacation in a place with basically no atmosphere, very little oxygen, totally different atmospheric pressure, no water, probably not the ability to go life, um, incredibly uh, diverse temperatures, heats and extremes. No one else is there. There's no really way to communicate should anyone get hurt. I'm talking, of course, about on Mars, devoid of basically everything on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, or in Cancun with Ted Cruz. Please vote now. <laughs> Flights are cheap right now. So, yeah. Where's the <laughs> <sounds best. laughs> did, <I>, <laughs> did I sufficiently like really set it up? You really wanted me to like just keep going? Was that good? Did, was yeah. That... Yeah. I wanted, I wanted some Mars facts for the people. And oh, I you have... Mars facts. It's, I felt torn this yeah. week because like space is the dinosaur's mortal enemy. But at the same time, we may be able to now through this rover detect. Uh, evidence of ancient life on a different planet. Dinosaur yeah. friends, who knows? Who knows? I know Sue and the T-Rex is actually trying to go to Mars to fight it. But as a rock person, Christine, I feel like you're a good middle ground between the meteorite and the dinosaurs because you study rocks or geologists. So you don't have to pick a side. But but Sarah, I'm going to make you pick a side. I'm going to I'm going to say something wait, controversial. Wait, wait. Space or dinosaurs? Wait, say it again. Base or dinosaurs? Pick a side, we're at war. Dinosaurs. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it looks like, like 14 of you are going to Cancun with Ted Cruz, which is more <laughs> than I would have bet. But like, if you can avoid him and keep your headphones in, maybe. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Well, yeah, and Brett made a very impor important uh, point in the chat, and that is yeah. uh, that if you can bully Ted Cruz, like you said, we're going with Ted Cruz. You didn't say like, whether we have to get along with Ted Cruz. If we can bully Ted Cruz the whole time, that's actually kind of fun. Like I, I you just, just, get, like just throw get drunk and eggs at him, you know, that sounds fun. I can do that. All right, that would make me feel alive. Uh, you know what else makes me feel alive, Sarah, is hearing you talk about your study organism. And that was oh, a segue okay. to talk about. Now our top, I guess we're down to the top four that you chose extant squid species. Um, there are approximately how many different species of squid alive today? About 300. 300. So we're going to, you picked four, which means these got to be top tier, which I assume is why you started with your study organism. So could you tell us about the Hawaiian bobtail squid? Uh, what's its deal? Why did you study it? And like exactly what were you studying? Yes. So the Hawaiian bobtail squid are about the size of a, a key lime. They're quite small, dumpling shaped, incredibly cute rainbow colored it's hard to tell in this picture because you're mostly seeing the brownish red chromatophores but look along the arm 
of uh, this little squid and on the eye of the squid, you see the iridophores that when you see them in real life, really, really pop. They're so sparkly and gorgeous and amazing. The reason most scientists study the Hawaiian bobtail squid is because of their partnership with a bacterium that glows in the dark. It's called Vibrio fisheri. Uh, it glows all the time, not just in the dark. It's bioluminescent, not uh, phosphorescent, um, but regardless. So the squid come out at night, they're nocturnal. During the day, they scoot and bury themselves in the sand so that they can hide when the sun's out. When the sun sets, they go out and they hunt for shrimp and uh, they use the light from the bacteria to basically match the moonlight coming down from above which is so cool. And the reason that we really like to use them as a study species in the uh, kind of symbiosis uh, world, kind of like the, the animal microbe interaction world is because in that light organ, it's like a little pouch where they keep the bacteria, there's just one species of bacteria in there. And so that makes it way easier to understand the complex communication between beneficial bacteria and the animal that they're living with. So that's why we study them. And I was studying um, two things. One, how the immune system of the squid can tell the difference between their little glowing bacterial buddy and everything else they're gonna encounter in the seawater. So that was one major project. And the other one uh, Dustin actually helped me with when he was in Australia uh, is studying the accessory nidimental gland or the ANG for short. Um, that's an organ that's only in the female squid and hosts a bunch of different kinds of bacteria, all kind of like pink, orange, yellow, bright colors, really cool. And the female squid, when they go to lay their eggs, will add the bacteria to the jelly coat of the eggs. So the eggs kind of look like onions when you slice them in half because they have a bunch of little layers of jelly that have bacteria in them. And that little bacteria create antibiotics, antifungals to protect the baby squid because the eggs get laid like under a rock or whatever and the, they need protection. So I looked at uh, how similar the bacterial communities are between different species of bobtail squid and cuttlefish. And, and Dustin picked me up some ANGs uh, and sent them back to me in Connecticut. That is true. But you know what else I did is you allow me to take this picture. That's true. Yeah, that's true. That's uh, that's two squid having sex. In case you were wondering, in yeah, case you were wondering, when we were collecting squid in Hawaii, it was it was fun. I like the arms wrapped around, holding on. It's cute. It's like spooning, right. squidding. It is. All right. So from the Hawaiian bobtail squid uh, to what you told me was called the strawberry squid, but I'm going to go with the internet, which called it the cockeyed strawberry squid. Yes. Yes, um, and they're called cockeyed for a reason because one of their eyes is really small and the other eye is ginormous and the reason for that is because one of these eyes is looking down and it's looking for bioluminescence in the same depth same area as that squid is and this video will show you um what this squid looks like in action so they're called the strawberry squid because they're covered in little photophores, um, which are little spots of uh, bioluminescence, and they kind of look like strawberries. So here you see the small eye. This is the eye that's looking in its general area for bioluminescence. And then this other big, bulbous, what? yellow eye is what? looking up. And the reason it needs to be so ginormous is that it's looking uh, to tell the difference between the light coming down from above and the silhouettes of animals swimming above. And that is, it's, it's living like 200 to 1,000 meters below sea level. So that's quite deep and very, very dark, as you can see in this video. And so it needs to have really, really good detectors for light to see the difference between those two amounts of light. And so um, it also is yellow to filter out some light. So it's better able to see silhouettes swimming above. That that eyeball is bonkers to me. It's awesome. That is bonkers. Um, you mentioned a word, which is reminding me, guess what, Sarah? It is time for everyone's second favorite game. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on. Where's I lost my... Uh, oh, wait, oh, second favorite only in terms of chronological occurrence, not in terms of how much we love it. 
Exactly. It is the M draws in front of everyone while the guest birth, that's you, Sarah, attempts to figure out what guest birth related topic word or phrase M is attempting to digitally render whiteboard challenge. Mbari are always finding amazing wildlife in the deeps. There we go. M, I'm going to bring you to the front. Uh, M, where are you and what are you drinking as a form of introduction? <laughs> I'm in my living room and I'm drinking a garage beer. That's cool. illegal. Here's how this is going to work. There are three rounds. I have private message M, the three hints for each round. It is a topic or a word or phrase she's going to try to render on the whiteboard. Sarah, it is your job to try to figure out what she is drawing, obviously with the help of the chat. Remember, these are all somewhat related to you or today's topic or current events. Uh, M, when you are ready, take it away. Oh, I'm ready. Here we go. Sarah, you have a whiteboard behind you, so I am assume you're familiar with this type of thing. I love whiteboards. New to Brank. Oh, it's so bad. <laughs> oh, I know exactly what you're doing, Em. No, this is perfect. We have a banana slug in the, in the <laughs> Pikachu is a guest in the chat. Oh, I see it. I see it. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't know not. it, I wouldn't know. Sarah, you, you know, might you know. have to you might be uh, do good by looking in the chat. It may help you. A hoagie. <laughs> what? A wawa hoagie. Wawa, it's wawa. It's wawa. Wawa. Oh, I know. I see. I see the uh, the wawa. Why didn't you guess wawa then? No, I. Well, I had no idea. I see it now. Now that when I saw the two colors, colors, I was like, wawa. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, and when you're ready, round two. Remember, Sarah, the points are doubled. <laughs> Utters, squid, <laughs> cuttlefish, okay, we have, we have bobtail squid. squid. We have squid. Listen, Rachel, I appreciate your guess in the chat, but the clue is not squid. That would be too easy. Squid loves. Squid heart. And then we, what? Okay. Oh, there's Interesting. love. Maybe squid there's heart. another. Squid organism. loves bacteria. Indiana Jones, the kingdom of the crystal squid. <laughs> squid loves bioluminescence. Symbiosis. Yeah! <laughs> Jada nailed in the chat. She said it was the relationship. Yep. yep. I get it. I get it. I've never noticed that the squid can look like a skull pretty easily in the drawing. That's true. But that's, that's, that's just true. a testament to M's talent. Um, M, whenever you're ready, take it away. Round three, Sarah, the points are quintupled. <laughs> the squid mobile. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, okay. you did. I really had my hand on my air horn. Good <laughs> job, Sarah. Um, M, thank you so much for facilitating what turned out to be an easier round than I was expecting. I don't know how she got symbiosis. Well done, Sarah. Listen, can you I literally your... play science games for for my job. Like that's my job is entertaining with science. I do a lot of silly games that we make up, so I it's really unfair. Can you tell everyone what the Squidmobile is? Because I forgot to put a picture up of it. Absolutely. So the Squidmobile is my car. It's my RAV4. Um, again, like Chapstick should uh, sponsor you and probably White Claw should, uh, based on my wild guess, should uh, sponsor Christina. RAV4s should sponsor me because I my Squidmobile is world renowned. So it has Squidmobile on one side and it says, honk if you love squid on the other side. It's covered in drawings of squid that I drew on there with um, like washable paint. On the back, it says, uh, want a squid fact? Text squid to nine run squid. And then you get squid facts texted by yours truly whenever wait, 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 I'm driving. Or... What are you texting to get a squid fact? You text squid exclamation point to me. You text the number nine rung squid. So you text nine rung squid and you'll get a squid. Like this? I, well, I'm, we need to test this right now, obviously. So you, te you text squid exclamation point to the number nine rung squid, is that correct? That's correct, that's correct. Right. Well, I'm sure I'm, you're probably gonna get a bunch of texts literally right now. Um, has it happened yet? Uh, one person. Did I put the right? number in the chat also people are wondering that's right <laughs> people are wondering if this is your personal number and you will be texting us back each individually or if it's um, an automatic feedback 
it's uh, okay so it's a google voice number so it's not my like phone number phone number it's my google voice number but i do have to put them in um as a person not as a robot I also got the question in the chat. Uh, shout out to Josh who dropped a very informative link, but can you explain to people what Wawa is and why we should love it? Yes, Wawa is the quintessential shop for all of your needs in Philadelphia. So maybe you're hungry and you need a hoagie. You can go grab a hoagie and a drink. You can get coffee, you can get whatever you, a, a soft pretzel, you can get whatever you need at the Wawa. Maybe you've been driving and you need gasoline. No problem. They'll also have gasoline. Maybe you, uh, you know, need a healthy snack for those types of people. You can get a, a fruit or whatever. It's like, a it's fruit. all things. You can get a fruit. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> a singular fruit. A fruit. You can get a uh, yeah, no milkshake. milkshake. Choose your thickness. That's right. They got a little machine. Um, I learned something it's new. Perfect. It's everything you need. Inexpensive, convenient, quintessential. Can you get squid ink? First of all, ink is a drink, so I'm gonna tell you that was that was blatant. But can you get squid ink at uh, Wawa? I maybe occasionally in pasta, but I don't think so generally. You can't get like a bottle of squid ink at a Wawa. Hmm. That's fair, that's fair. I just was very surprised that we've gone 33, 36 minutes and we've not mentioned squids inking. And you're gonna tell us about pygmy squids inking. Uh, and so I'm gonna share my screen and do it because this is a really cool video. Yeah, these are pygmy squid. They're like 16 millimeters-ish long and what's cool that we only realized this very recently some scientists in japan witnessed this they will use their ink as like a hunting blind so they'll like squirt out a little bit of ink then hide behind hide behind and then kaboom attack their food um and it's just so clever so typically ink is used uh as a way of hiding to get away um confusing predators but this squid uses it in the attack as a uh as a predator itself. So that's pretty cool. Pygmy squid are also just like very, very cute. They live in the Indo-Pacific and Australia, Japan, all around there. Um, and the next video, are you gonna show the video of them sticking? Okay, good, good, good. So the other cool thing about pygmy squid and the reason that I call them the post-it notes of the sea is that they can secrete basically like underwater glue to stick to blades of seagrass, chunks of coral, a little bit of sponge or whatever, so that they can just like kind of hang in the seawater and look around without having to expend any energy in uh, actively swimming. So here we have, oh, oh they're so cute. Uh, it's just, yeah, upside down, sticking to a, a piece of sponge and uh, looking around, uh, adorable, adorable. Uh, adorable. So going from very small, so like I'd heard of the pygmy squid. And so I was like, well, if we're going to do tiny pygmy squid, we should probably go the other way and do giant squid. And until I talked to you this week, I was under the impression that the giant squid was the most giant of all squids. Uh, I'm probably biased because I've spent an inordinate amount of time at the American Museum of Natural History, including in front of this diorama right here, which is a giant squid being attacked by a sperm whale, but you informed me this week that the giant squid is not the giantest of the squid species. Which one is it? It's the colossal squid. They are the same length-ish as the giant squid, but they're a little fuller bodied. Uh, they are uh, just perfect and, and, and huggable in every way. Uh, we, we love the colossal squid. They are not, not as much is known about colossal squid um, as giant squid because giant squid pretty much live everywhere in the deep, deep, deep sea. And colossal squid are located pretty much just in the Southern Ocean. And the Southern Ocean is really hard to get to, not only uh, because it's, it's far away from um, a lot of places, it's like in the most remote area, but the seas are super rough and dangerous there. The current there pretty much just whips around Antarctica in a little circle, and that makes the waves have nothing to smack up against, like the waves in the Pacific and the Atlantic, they'll eventually whack into a body of land. But in the, in the uh, Southern Ocean, they're just like, there's nothing to stop them. So the waves get incredibly large, incredibly dangerous for boats. And so getting there is um, 
hard. So uh, anyway, less research is able to be done. It's just harder to do in the Southern Ocean. And so we don't know as much about them, but we're learning and sending submersibles down to try to figure out more about them. We do know a couple of cool things about them though. One, they eat Antarctic toothfish, which uh, you may know as Chilean sea bass. So anytime that you're eating Chilean sea bass, you're, uh, you're eating the favorite meal of, um, of, of colossal squid, but don't because uh, their fisheries is not great. And also the coolest thing that we know about them is that on their suction cups, on the ends of their tentacles, they have rotating hooks. So a lot of squid on their tentacles, just to, to clarify, the tentacles are these dangly guys down here. Um, and these are their arms. Can you see my, uh, I don't know, you probably can't see my uh, arrow, just Dustin. But on uh, even Humboldt squid, little market squid, they'll have little serrated rings of teeth on the edge of the suction cup on the clubs of the tentacles, like what kind of looks like the hands of the tentacles in these pictures. You can see it really nice in this uh, picture with the, with the uh, sperm whale. Um, but the colossal squid, in addition to those little rings, has little hooks that can pivot around. So let's say it grabs into uh, a prey item and the prey item tries to swim away. The swivel hooks will get, will swivel and then hook in. <laughs> so uh, ultimate spooky. That's badass. Uh, speaking of anatomy, uh, Letty was very curious. Uh, is that the squid's anus? Uh, also segue to talk about how they have beaks because we haven't mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, so that's not its butthole. That is a beak. So um, the butthole is like inside the siphon. The siphon is like that little thing kind of like um, under where the, it would be where this human's red hand is. Um, and inside the siphon, the anus is in there. And so the, what you're looking at there is the mouth. And, and uh, a lot of squid beaks are surrounded by um, like really strong muscly areas. And that little thing that looks like a butthole that isn't is the um, like beak shield kind of. And when they actually want to bite that, like the, 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 the beak kind of comes out a bit and kind of expands. And... Okay. Um... Christina, I'm sure we have a number of questions for our famed squid biologists, but before we do, should we ask the really important question about the very medium in which squid live? Oh, that's incredibly important. I've heard yeah. it come up and yeah, we need to get to the bottom of this. So where, what is, what is the molecule in which um, squid live? Water. Right, that is, that is potentially correct. Uh, can you H2O? say it one more time? Water? Water. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm just we're Christine and I were curious to know which is the correct incorrect spelling of that word because we've thought about this too, Sarah. Which is the correct incorrect spelling of what I would pronounce as water? Say it again. Water. Christina. Water. Wow, we all of us say it differently. Interesting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is an interesting poll. Uh, we have, it's neck and neck between W-O-O-D-E-R, which I believe is Sarah's Wooter pronunciation, and then water, I think is W-T-T-E-R. I don't. I see a couple alternatives in the chat too. W-U-D-D seems to be coming up. Uh, water. Oh, w uh, Dustin, you're being asked to pronounce it again. Let's, the three of us, let's do another round. I'll go first, then Christina, then uh, Sarah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> water. 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 <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Sarah, I love so much the way you pronounce water. We're gonna My dad it. does it the same. My aunts, my cousins. Oh, <laughs> water. Apparently the correct incorrect spelling is not yours, W-O-O-D-E-R. It is W-U-T-T-E-R. That's that's science. This is how science is done. This is a scientific poll. Water. People have spoken. The people have spoken. They've also spoken <laughs> lots of questions. Christina. Can you hit our, our famed expert with some squid and dinosaur questions? Hey, if you have a dinosaur question for Sarah, ask away. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to start with a fossilization question because uh, I want to answer it and I have a prop and then I want to hear from you all because you have some fossils around too. Uh, so I got the question, how can we tell how old these were when they lived if they were mostly soft? Because we know that soft parts don't really get fossilized. So we really, really depend on their hard parts. So like the shells you've seen, 
probably modern squids will just find their beaks. It's like their only hard part. And there was a kind with an internal uh, cone. So I have some of these uh, belemnite fossils and it's like all that's left of these guys that were around uh, like 400 to 200 million years ago, it, they had an inside shell. So we really just depend on hard parts to fossilize. And if there is some soft squishy part that remains in the fossil record, that is super, super rare. Um, but yeah, uh, Dustin and Sarah, what can you add to, how do we know when they lived, if, if they were mostly squishy and could there be some missing? I'm sure there are some missing. Um, I am not an expert in ancient things. I'm an expert in living things. So you two probably know a lot more about this than I do, but I think like looking at what's around it, how deep it is, like in the stratification, something, 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 um, is how you know how old it is. Um, and that's all I know. But I do know that uh, for sure, modern cephalopods are really hard to find in the fossil record. Occasionally you'll find some. Um, occasionally you'll find just like what looks like an ink sac uh, like it'll get stained kind of, which is so cool. Um, but again, super rare compared to the shelled stuff. That's yeah. all I know. Yeah. To make a, to make a fossil, um, you generally need some sort of hard stuff that can, what we uh, call per mineralized, like permanent mineralization per mineralized. And that's one of the ways, in fact, that something I saw a question in the chat about how something becomes opalized whatever the ground usually i mean it's different obviously at the bottom of the ocean that is on land but whatever the earth the minerals in the earth and the groundwater around something when it is buried over time will can seep into the actual organic material inside um like the scaffolding of that um that skeleton and replace it so you're actually replacing the things like calcium inside the bone with the opal or whatever other uh, material and mineral is around it and so over time that completely replaces the organic stuff with the inorganic stuff. And at that point, you've gone from a skeleton to an actual rock. And fossils are actually solid rocks. They're no longer, well, these body fossils are no longer actually like, uh, when you say they're like, their bones are not bones anymore. They've been bones for millions of years. At this point, it's a solid rock because it's been per-mineralized. Mm -hmm. That's why you cool. see- But I don't know what's talking about like, how that happens at the bottom of the ocean. Um, not sure. How that happened at the bottom of the ocean? O opalization specifically or fossilization? Oh, just in general. Like, yeah, love same to hear deal more as on land. You have water that has minerals dissolved into it and those minerals get into the living thing and replace those, those materials with mineral. So same deal why you see a, a dino skeleton in a museum, it looks brown because those minerals of the bones have been replaced with the mineral from the water that flowed through them. Same deal with how you would uh, opalize a little ammonite, the mineral in the water that it got, uh, that got into those organic materials, replaced it with uh, opal, which is a big, a fancy form of quartz. Cool. Yeah. Uh, oh boy, do we have questions. Sarah, what's the deal with squid eyes? Is there, is there vision underwater in the depths and the darkness exceptional? Do they rely on something else? What's up with their eyes? So their eyes are structurally wildly similar to ours. And it's a really, really cool example of convergent evolution. Um, they, for the most part, cannot see color. Um, they're colorblind, which is wild because uh, cephalopods on the whole are incredibly good at blending into their surroundings, particularly octopus and cuttlefish. Um, and so we don't really understand how they do that so well. Um, they, the one cool thing about their vision is that they can see polarized light, whereas we can't. So color, which obviously we can for the most part see, um, is all determined by the wavelength of the light that's hitting our retina. And the polarized light, we can't see. But effectively, instead of looking at the wavelength of the light, you're looking at the angle that the light is going. And so like, how are they perceiving that? We don't know. Do they perceive the polarization? Like we perceive color, I, we don't know. Um, but it is, is super, super cool. And so um, if you've ever put on like polarized sunglasses, um, that is like a slight view into their world, but not quite. Um, it's only letting a certain polarization through. And so, uh, yeah, that's cool. And um, in terms of how they see in the deep, 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 deep sea, Generally speaking, they have like hilariously big eyes. Like if you've ever seen 
Um, there's the like little purple squid that was seen by the submersibles uh, and all the scientists started laughing because it was like the biggest possible big googly eyes. Um, and so a lot of them just have ginormous eyes. The giant squid has the biggest eyes in the animal kingdom. They are a large. Um, and so, yeah, they just have really, really big uh, pupils to gather all the light they can. Um, and that's how they do it. That polarization is blowing my mind. So cool. So, it's like weird to think about. The harder I think about it, uh, the more kind of freaked out I get <laughs> at the thought. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Well, I'm going to dream about that tonight if I sleep. Great. Can you, tentacles versus arms. Yeah. They're two, two different things anatomically, right? Yeah, totally. So arms have suction cups all along the appendage. So what you're seeing, um, like in this picture of the colossal squid, those are arms. We've got suction cups all the way down. And then um, the tentacles are for the most part, like kind of tucked in between the arms under normal swimming conditions because you don't want little danglers hanging out um, and like dragging you effectively. Um, so you really don't need them out. You only really need them out when you're going to attack something. This isn't true of all squid because some squid use their, their danglers for other stuff, um, like just to kind of bump into whatever you happen to bump into and then attack. But for the most part, they're like tucked in. And then when the squid wants to attack, this is a really nice picture. So you see the like those little dark brown tips at the end of the light brown speckled arms. That's like what, what a lot of uh, squid and cuttlefish in particular do. They kind of like point their faces in the direction of the thing that they're about to attack. And then the tentacles start to inch out. And then in one fluid fast motion, they shoot out, grab the prey and then pull it back in. And so tentacles are super stretchy um and and rubbery and so that helps them attack stuff uh, we're, we're stuck on the term little danglers uh, same. <laughs> <laughs> uh how long is a giant or a colossal squid expected to live Ooh. awesome question so it's so sad they live like three to five years we think um, at least the giant squid. I don't know if we know for the colossal squid yet. Squid on the whole are a live fast, die hard type of organism. The longest lived uh, coleoid cephalopods, that's the squid, octopus, cuttlefish, not the nautilus, because they're kind of their own thing within the cephalopods. They're weird. They, they're, they're delightful and I love them so much. They're so cute and bump into things and it, it just, it brings me joy. Yeah. But, um, okay, so the, uh, longest lived octopus is the longest lived cephalopod that we're familiar with. They will um, brood their eggs. So a lot of uh, pretty much all octopuses I can think of off the top of my head will lay their eggs on maybe a rock, um, maybe under a coconut shell, something like that, and then hang out with their eggs and like clean them and aerate them um, until the eggs hatch. Now, most species that takes couple weeks from laying the eggs to hatching. Um, and the, the octo mom will die after the eggs hatch. Um, she pretty much stands vigil until they hatch. And there's this one species of octopus that uh, Mbari, the uh, Monterey Bay Research Institute out in California, they kept going back to check on this same octopus who kept brooding her eggs. She was there for four and a half years, which means she didn't eat for four and a half years as far as we know, um, which she just looked ragged and raggeder and raggeder over the, that time. And then um, eventually her little babies hatched. Um, and so if she's just brooding for four and a half years, like, how long she's living longer than that. She's living maybe a max of 15 years, um, but we don't really know. And so uh, most squid live six months to a year. Uh, my little bobtails live six to nine, uh, pygmy six months. Um, so real short lives, unfortunately. I got the question in the fast. It's like, <laughs> they just get, they just eat a lot. They're eating so much. To keep a squid alive in captivity, you need to be feeding it a wild amount of food, particularly the ones that are up and swimming all the time. That's why most aquariums don't have squid because they need a lot of room to swim and you need to eat, I mean, you need to feed them so much food to get them to grow as quickly as they need to grow and to keep them energetically sated. 
energetically sated. Uh, I would not want to be anywhere near a growing colossal squid. No. Uh, yucks. Uh, I got the question in the chat. Uh, is one I'm excited to answer. What was the weirdest extinct cephalopod? Uh, the first one that comes to mind is, so just uh, ancient cephalopods went from coney to swirly to lumpy to ridgy to paper clippy. They had so many strange, strange shell shapes because they were so soft and squishy. They needed creative ways to keep themselves from being eaten. Uh, look up Nipponides. Am I saying this right? Am I saying this like a gladiator? Nipponides had this like pretzel, swirly shell that uh, I can't come up with a reason for. Uh, <laughs> but just <laughs> pick your favorite shell shape. And one of these ammonites had it, I guess, to help regulate its height in the water column and to help it uh, not get eaten. It looks like a meatball. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a tangled it's really pit of meatball. <laughs> Do you have a, a favorite weird extant? Uh, cephalopod. God, there are so many cephalopods that I like so much. I think probably the strawberry squid is my favorite weirdo um, because it's such a silly goose and I like it a lot. Um, but there are a lot of cephalopods that are amazing. Like the giant Australian cuttlefish is large and its arms look like, like a billowy duvet cover. I think that they're hilarious watching them wrestle each other when it's mating season the big males will wrestle each other um for dominance and i mean it's hilarious because look, it looks like two pillows like big fluffy old lady pillows with like the ruffly edges attacking each other it cracks me up i love it um so i could talk about different cool weird squid, squid species uh all day and all night um it's hard to choose that's why we love you uh finally what what is Skype a scientist? Ooh, good question. Skype a scientist is the nonprofit I founded in 2017 and I'm the executive director of now. It's my full-time job. I'm really, really, really lucky uh, to have enough support to uh, be able to, to do this for, for work. So my job is uh, running the program, which is Skype a scientist. Skype a scientist is a program that matches scientists of all different kinds with classrooms, scout troops, library groups, book clubs, any other group of people that wants to talk to a scientist. In 2020, we served 11,600 groups for free with scientists. There's a suggested donation, which most, most people don't do, but um, it, I, we appreciate so much when they do, of 10 bucks a session. So it's wildly affordable, even if you donate when you don't have to. Um, and so it's all about starting conversations, making personal connections with scientists. And so, um, we also do live streams for kids about once, maybe twice a week. Uh, we cover all sorts of different topics. We cover uh, a diversity in terms of science specialties, but also in terms of scientific representation. We uh, try to include racial, gender, disability, all sorts of uh, diversity of representations of science and scientists particularly, because we wanna give everybody uh, a model for someone like them in science. Additionally, when we match up scientists in classrooms, the teachers can tell us if over half of their classroom is from a given historically excluded group in STEM, we will try to match them with a scientist from that same group to like maximize the representation that's happening. Um, we also do trivia for adults every Thursday night. It's five bucks and your five bucks goes into a grant program that we are going to be using and launching. We hope if we, if we can raise enough money um, this fall, but uh, we don't quite have enough yet um, to support science communication projects by historically excluded science communicators because there's not enough money in science communication as a, as a field. And so we are trying to boost that uh, in, in the best way we, we know how. And so we're doing that through adults having fun uh, over science trivia. And so um, come on Thursday nights, I will add the link. It's super fun. Um, it's a lot like this, but, uh, but a little, uh, mm, I don't wanna say more structured, but it's like games. Like you, you hang out in breakout rooms instead of uh, whatever you'd call this uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, <laughs> let's art more this. question. Uh, well, all this is a good way to describe exactly whatever this is. I mean, I come to this willingly all the time. I, I have a lot of fun of whatever this is. <laughs> yeah, um, drop a link in the chat. If you are a teacher or you have, or you're a scientist or you have a group, 
Skype for Science is great. Like I've gotten to link up with classrooms literally around the world and just nerd out with some kiddos for half an hour here and there. Uh, and trivia every Thursday night is an awesome, fun way to help support the program. So we're dropping the links in the chat. Um, Sarah, are you ready for what is sure to be the best paleo art gallery that you've seen this week? I'm so ready. I can't wait. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to show off our Ankyla, our heavily armored and very well strangely protected ankylosauruses. So hold those up. I will highlight your screen. Sarah, I'd like to hear your commentary. Christina, you as well, obviously. I know you have an art history background. That's a joke. We're going to start with Eileen. Oh, Pac-Man tail. <gasps> oh, yeah. I don't. I am happy I'm not a little dot because I don't want to get chomped by that. I love it. It looks like from Mario. Oh my God, amazing. Yeah. Wow. All I right, all right, enough of it. Wow. Yeah, it's down. It's sick. Oh my God. So many oh. talent artists come to this, it blows my mind. You guys, this mm -hmm. might, our next uh, thing that I'm gonna highlight, this might be a first. I don't know that I've seen Ooh. this happen yet. Oh my God. Hannah Bates. Hannah baked, y'all. Made an Kylo with marmalade filling for protection. Oh cat, my God. Cat cookie for scale. That's I want to eat it. That's amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm missing oh, a top. Very here, smart. But I think oh, top hat's down there. Oh, there it is. I didn't see it. Sorry. Sorry. Protection from COVID. That is a masked up dino. Smart. Necessary. Also, look, the, the tail looks like a little squid fin. That's good. That's good. I love it. SPF 500. SPF 500. <laughs> That's what I need most of the time. That's fair. Uh, it's I don't know if it's one of its legs is black or that it's- No, cool. it's shaded. It's shaded oh, by the okay. sun. All right, you're right. I'm being- Yeah, that's called we're, shading. We're looking, this is that? depth of field we're seeing. Okay. I love it. Uh, speaking of uh, strange leg parts, what's- ah! <laughs> <gasps> Oh, it's going to meet a squid friend. Oh, God. <laughs> I love the idea of four-legged animals and flippers. It's good. It's perfect. <laughs> oh, another beach. Oh, oh it's Rihanna God. themed. You can stand under that Ammonite's umbrella. This is, really oh. this is warming my heart. Yeah. At Dino 101, we stand Rihanna hard. As as we should. As well as friendship. Oh, oh a club tail. Chonked. Is that what that said? Round and his eyes are so cute. I find this drawing slightly sexual, so I'm gonna move on. <laughs> yeah, he's looking back at it. <laughs> is it's oh, Wait, is it a scarf? Bubble wrap? Is it's it bubble wrap? wrap? Yeah, bubble there. wrap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. That's amazing. Uh, this is a good reminder. Please upload these um, on Twitter, Instagram. Tag myself, Sarah, Christina, Atlas Obscura. Sarah, or Christina, can you drop some links in the chat? Yeah, uh, I got it. Upload these. We will reshare them. <laughs> wow. Okay. Maybe take <laughs> like, like Dilophosaurus with the spinning, but like the green vomit. I like that. I like it. Also, your hair looks great. Oh, and you're holding a little squid. Oh, a little squid. Squid stands. Their spiky face. Ankylosaurus. Thor. Oh, yeah, check out that tail. That's awesome. Wow. It's overall an intimidating animal. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> this is one of the weirdest drawings I've seen. This um, is great. I geez. love it. Please Very post that to Instagram and tag me so I can add it to my story because that is really funny. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. It's really, it's really never not good. impressed by these. Hi. Oh, Brittany. Uh, when an ankylosaurus went rogue in defense against the dark arts of wizard school. Oh, I think this is that wizard book people like. <laughs> it is yeah, the wizard book. There I was a giant that. squid in the wizard book. That's fair. Uh, Mama Anki A A Losaurus. Oh, I like the hair curlers in the tiger. Yeah, 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 Losaurus. Losaurus. Oh my God! Beautiful. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I am <laughs> reticent to go to our next person because our oh, next person God. is actually. You know what? I'm gonna save it. What's a chunkla? What? Y'all, it's a chunkla. Look, look at the tail. A it's a chunkla. A chunkla plus club. 
Oh, look it up. Oh. Oh, nice. <laughs> what? The tail, the back of the tail is so thick, and I like That's that a lot. Tail. It's a. It's, thick. Uh, it's chunky, and I'm into it. Oh, oh so thick. This is good. That's very good. We got a couple more here. Uh, Colleen, that's a cat, not a squid. <laughs> that's right. Very, I was never wondering be, how very long important. it would take. I was wondering how long it would take until we got to a condom. Is that in Kylo styles? I <laughs> would purchase that just for the name. In Kylo <laughs> it has to be ribbed, right? Because and Kylo stores are too. Yeah, of course, sure. of course. Cuteness protection. This is a timeline cleanse right here. Is <laughs> right. That is right. Oh, we got two. Two. Whoa. Oh, it's like a gyrus. <laughs> I like its belt. Good. It's Very an good. energy wow. orb. With a catapult. Oh, oh man, not just um, defense. This one has offense too. Wow. Love that. The best yeah. defense is a good offense. It's solar powered. Mm -hmm. And it's solar powered. This is similar. We got a Captain America situation on the back here. Ooh, yeah, that okay. shield. Well, we haven't had a bird's eye view yet. How do we feel about this? Ooh, Roman shield, cool. I love a labeled diagram. I'm about this. That's very cool. Stay COVID safe, mask. mask up. That virus, no more, hashtag no COVID. Like Good job, that. Color. The subtle color shading here is real nice. <laughs> skunk. I get I like skunks in general. And I like ankylosaurus. So this is really hitting a lot of uh a lot of positive points for me. Yeah, flattery will get you every what? <laughs> I like the squid in the basket. That's real nice. I like this. I prefer yeah, this slow sign attached to the club tail is that's doing it for me. That's doing it. We're going to our post-it note. Oh, the post-it notes. Very beautiful. Yeah, I guess he's been doing this since the beginning. Look at those framed. No, they're really amazing. In the back. This is a classic in Kylo that I don't want to mess with. Glitter. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and Kylosaur. I love it. Good. This one is oh, I love that moment <laughs> here. This is I like this. I, I feel like there's like motion and action here. I'm into Absolutely. it. Absolutely. This looks like an animal, but uh, oh man, backsaw, nice backsaw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do not eat. <laughs> Can you zoom back a little bit, Josh? Josh and I play frisbee together. Uh, he's he's created a masterpiece. It looks like. Are you flying this? Is it like a this like a? Animal? Yeah, this is amazing. <gasps> Move it up. I want to see the bottom. <laughs> there That's you go. Balloon. <laughs> it's just gonna jet right away. Oh, another Alex. mask. Yeah, I'm happy you're masking up. I think okay. that might be the last of our ankylosaurs. Uh, Carrie, I just want to give a shout out to Carrie for the time and effort put into this one. You know, that's Carrie. That's kind of you're a star. That's the kind another of low TV. bar. Always here to meet expectations that we like to work with at Dino 101. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, I'm gonna take this back. Um, oh, it's only 10 to, at 10.09. We are one minute shorter than the amount we are usually over. Uh, hold on one second. Christina, I'm trying to find you. Oh, there you are. No, Carrie, you're Carrie. back. Carrie's back. We're trying to get rid of Carrie. Carrie, get out of here. We love um, you, Carrie. Sarah, I'm going to come to you first once I can find you and highlight you. Where are you, Sarah? I'm right here. I'm right here. That doesn't It help. says our name on the thing. Oh. There you are. Sarah, um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. One more reminder, everyone, definitely check out Skype the Scientist. At least come to the trivia on Thursdays. It's a very fun time, and it supports a very good cause. Do you have any final last parting words? Is this the moment you finally admit that you love dinosaurs? Um, I do love dinosaurs. I just love squid a little bit more. Um, but I do, of course, Justin. Of course I love dinosaurs. Love dinosaurs since I was a little kid. Do you admit that you love squid? I love squid. I had a moment of realization there when I was like, shit, I really do love cephalopods. They're really, really I'm, I'm good. I'm not here to say one is better than the other because we all know what I really put cephalopods, man. I'm glad you were here. Uh, we'll nerd out about squid anytime. 
That's right. Thank you for being here. Christina, do you have any final last words before we bid everyone adieu? Oh man, yeah, I, I think as a rock person, it's nice to be on the middle ground bet between squids and dinos. I mm -hmm. love a cephalopod. I love a cephalopod, but of course I'm here every week because I love dinos. Uh, I hope that tonight you have found to be an inclusive uh, learning environment. And uh, I just want to say that I appreciate you taking in these facts and uh, you know tossing them around for your consideration. <laughs> oh, that's a really good one. Consideration. I just saw I'm going, I'm, everyone's drinking. Everyone is drinking right now. I love that. Um, all right. So ladies and gentlemen, a couple final uh, announcements before we go. I want to mention that next week we have someone who thinks I haven't noticed what they changed their name to. Jada Elcock, TikTok sensation and shark expert Jada Elcock will be here to talk all about probably some of the greatest shark species that have ever existed. Jada, I'm gonna put you on the spot. I'm gonna ask on you two, what is your favorite species of shark? Oh my gosh, the thresher shark, because it has a really, really long tail and they like whip things with its tail. They hunt with its butt instead of its face. And I think that that's wild. So it's my favorite. <laughs> You've won me over already. Awesome. So Jada, next week, Sharks with Jada Elcock. If you don't follow Jada on uh, TikTok, you're not using TikTok correctly. I'm not even on TikTok and I got on there to watch your videos. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, the last announcement is after we are done here, which will be as soon as I shut the hell up, we always go to another Zoom room for our Dino 101 after party, which is totally not in association with Atlas Mascara at all. But if you want to keep hanging out and having a couple more drinks with us, the Zoom link is the same as last week's after party. If you need the link and want to come, dive headfirst into my DMs on either Instagram or Twitter, and I will send you the link. Ah, but until I see you in three minutes in the after party, I want to remind everyone, whether you're asking questions, digging for dinosaurs, or you're Ted Cruz reaching deep, deep down to try to find one iota of good in your being, never stop digging. I love all of you guys. I'll see you in the after party, and we'll see you next week for Sharks with Jada Elcock. Bye, everybody. We do